the mission of the Vedanta. On the occasion of his visit to Kumbakunam, the Swamiji was presented with the following address by the local Hindu community. Revered Swami, On behalf of the Hindu inhabitants of this ancient and religiously important town of Kumbakunam, we request permission to offer you a most hearty welcome on your return from the Western world to our own holy land of great temples and famous saints and sages. We are highly thankful to God for the remarkable success of your religious mission in America and in Europe and for His having enabled you to impress upon the choicest representatives of the world's great religions assembled at Chicago that both the Hindu philosophy and religion are so broad and so rationally Catholic as to have in them the power to exalt and to harmonize all ideas of God and of human spirituality. The conviction that the cause of truth is always safe in the hands of Him who is the life and soul of the universe has been for thousands of years part of our living faith, and if today we rejoice at the results of your holy work in Christian lands, it is because the eyes of men in and outside of India are thereby being opened to the inestimable value of the spiritual heritage of the preeminently religious Hindu nation. The success of your work has naturally added great luster to the already renowned name of your great Guru. It has also raised us in the estimation of the civilized world. More than all, it has made us feel that we too, as a people, have reason to be proud of the achievements of our past and that the absence of telling aggressiveness in our civilization is in no way a sign of its exhausted or decaying condition. With clear-sighted, devoted, and altogether unselfish workers like you in our midst, the future of the Hindu nation cannot but be bright and hopeful. May the God of the universe, who is also the great God of all nations, bestow on you health and long life, and make you increasingly strong and wise in the discharge of your high and noble function as a worthy teacher of Hindu religion and philosophy. A second address was also presented by the Hindu students of the town. The Swami then delivered the following address on the mission of the Vedanta. A very small amount of religious work performed brings a large amount of result. If this statement of the Gita wanted an illustration, I am finding every day the truth of that great saying in my humble life. My work has been very insignificant indeed, but the kindness and the cordiality of welcome that have met me at every step of my journey from Colombo to this city are simply beyond all expectation. Yet, at the same time, it is worthy of our traditions as Hindus, it is worthy of our race, for here we are, the Hindu race, whose vitality, whose life principle, whose very soul, as it were, is in religion. I have seen a little of the world, Travelling among the races of the East and the West, and everywhere I find among nations one great ideal which forms the backbone, so to speak, of that race. With some it is politics, with others it is social culture, others again may have intellectual culture and so on for their national background. But this, our motherland, has religion and religion alone for its basis, for its backbone, for the bedrock upon which the whole building of its life has been based. Some of you may remember that in my reply to the kind address which the people of Madras sent over to me in America, I pointed out the fact that a peasant in India has, in many respects, a better religious education than many a gentleman in the West, and today, beyond all doubt, I myself am verifying my own words. There was a time when I did feel rather discontented at the want of information among the masses of India and the lack of thirst among them for information, but now I understand it. Where their interest lies, there they are more eager for information than the masses of any other race that I have seen or have travelled among. Ask our peasants about the momentous political changes in Europe, the upheavals that are going on in European society, they do not know anything of them, nor do they care to know. But the peasants, even in Ceylon, 
detached from India in many ways, cut off from a living interest in India, I found the very peasants working in the fields there were already acquainted with the fact that there had been a parliament of religions in America, that an Indian sannyasin had gone over there, and that he had had some success, where, therefore, their interest is, there they are as eager for information as any other race, and religion is the one and sole interest of the people of India. I am not just now discussing whether it is good to have the vitality of the race in religious ideals or in political ideals, but so far it is clear to us that, for good or for evil, our vitality is concentrated in our religion. You cannot change it. You cannot destroy it and put in its place another. You cannot transplant a large growing tree from one soil to another and make it immediately take root there. For good or for evil, the religious ideal has been flowing into India for thousands of years. For good or for evil, the Indian atmosphere has been filled with ideals of religion for shining scores of centuries. For good or for evil, we have been born and brought up in the very midst of these ideas of religion, till it has entered into our very blood and tingled with every drop in our veins, and has become one with our constitution, become the very vitality of our lives. Can you give such religion up without the rousing of the same energy in reaction, without filling the channel which that mighty river has cut out for itself in the course of thousands of years? Do you want that the Ganga should go back to its icy bed and begin a new course? Even if that were possible, it would be impossible for this country to give up her characteristic course of religious life and take up for herself a new career of politics or something else. You can work only under the law of least resistance, and this religious line is the line of least resistance in India. This is the line of life, this is the line of growth, and this is the line of well-being in India to follow the track of religion. A. In other countries religion is only one of the many necessities in life. To use a common illustration which I am in the habit of using, my lady has many things in her parlour, and it is the fashion nowadays to have a Japanese vase, and she must procure it, it does not look well to be without it. So my lady, or my gentleman, has many other occupations in life, and also a little bit of religion must come in to complete it. Consequently, he or she has a little religion. Politics, social improvement, in one word, this world, is the goal of mankind in the West, and God and religion come in quietly as helpers to attain that goal. Their God is, so to speak, the being who helps to cleanse and to furnish this world for them, that is apparently all the value of God for them. Do you not know how for the last hundred or two hundred years you have been hearing again and again out of the lips of men who ought to have known better, from the mouths of those who pretend at least to know better, that all the arguments they produce against the Indian religion is this, that our religion does not conduce to well-being in this world that it does not bring gold to us, that it does not make us robbers of nations, that it does not make the strong stand upon the bodies of the weak and feed themselves with the lifeblood of the weak. Certainly our religion does not do that. It cannot send cohorts, under whose feet the earth trembles, for the purpose of destruction and pillage and the ruination of races. Therefore they say, what is there in this religion? It does not bring any grist to the grinding mill, any strength to the muscles, what is there in such a religion? They little dream that that is the very argument with which we prove out religion, because it does not make for this world. Ours is the only true religion because, according to it, this little sense world of three days duration is not to be made the end and aim of all is not to be our great goal. This little earthly horizon of a few feet is not that which bounds the view of our religion. Ours is a way beyond, and still beyond, beyond the senses, beyond space, 
and beyond time, away, away beyond, till nothing of this world is left and the universe itself becomes like a drop in the transcendent ocean of the glory of the soul. Ours is the true religion because it teaches that God alone is true, that this world is false and fleeting, that all your gold is but as dust, that all your power is finite, and that life itself is oftentimes an evil, therefore it is, that ours is the true religion. Ours is the true religion because, above all, it teaches renunciation and stands up with the wisdom of ages to tell and to declare to the nations who are mere children of yesterday in comparison with us Hindus who own the hoary antiquity of the wisdom discovered by our ancestors here in India to tell them in plain words, Children, you are slaves of the senses, there is only finiteness in the senses, there is only ruination in the senses. The three short days of luxury here bring only ruin. At last, give it all up, renounce the love of the senses and of the world, that is the way of religion. Through renunciation is the way to the goal and not through enjoyment. Therefore ours is the only true religion. A. It is a curious fact that while nations after nations have come upon the stage of the world, played their parts vigorously for a few moments, and died almost without leaving a mark or a ripple on the ocean of time, here we are living, as it were, an eternal life. They talk a great deal of the new theories about the survival of the fittest, and they think that it is the strength of the muscles which is the fittest to survive. If that were true, any one of the aggressively known old world nations would have lived in glory today, and we, the weak Hindus, who never conquered even one other race or nation, ought to have died out, yet we live here three hundred million strong. A young English lady once told me, What have the Hindus done? They never even conquered a single race. And it is not at all true that all its energies are spent, that atrophy has overtaken its body, that is not true. There is vitality enough, and it comes out in torrents and deluges the world when the time is ripe and requires it. We have, as it were, thrown a challenge to the whole world from the most ancient times. In the West, they are trying to solve the problem how much a man can possess, and we are trying here to solve the problem on how little a man can live. This struggle and this difference will still go on for some centuries. But if history has any truth in it, and if prognostications ever prove true, it must be that those who train themselves to live on the least and control themselves well will in the end gain the battle, and that those who run after enjoyment and luxury, however vigorous they may seem for the moment, will have to die and become annihilated. There are times in the history of a man's life, nay, in the history of the lives of nations, when a sort of world weariness becomes painfully predominant. It seems that such a tide of world weariness has come upon the Western world. There, too, they have their thinkers, great men, and they are already finding out that this race after gold and power is all vanity of vanities, many, nay, most of the cultured men and women there, are already weary of this competition, this struggle, this brutality of their commercial civilization, and they are looking forward towards something better. There is a class which still clings on to political and social changes as the only panacea for the evils in Europe, but among the great thinkers there, other ideals are growing. They have found out that no amount of political or social manipulation of human conditions can cure the evils of life. It is a change of the soul itself for the better that alone will cure the evils of life. No amount of force, or government, or legislative cruelty will change the conditions of a race, but it is spiritual culture and ethical culture alone that can change wrong racial tendencies for the better. Thus these races of the West are eager for some new thought, for some new philosophy, the religion they have had, Christianity, although good and glorious in many respects, 
has been imperfectly understood and is, as understood hitherto, found to be insufficient. The thoughtful men of the West find in our ancient philosophy, especially in the Vedanta, the new impulse of thought they are seeking, the very spiritual food and drink for which they are hungering and thirsting. And it is no wonder that this is so. I have become used to hear all sorts of wonderful claims put forward in favour of every religion under the sun. You have also heard, quite within recent times, the claims put forward by Dr. Barrows, a great friend of mine, that Christianity is the only universal religion. Let me consider this question a while and lay before you my reasons why I think that it is Vedanta and Vedanta alone that can become the universal religion of man and that no other is fitted for the role. Excepting our own almost all the other great religions in the world are inevitably connected with the life or lives of one or more of their founders. All their theories, their teachings, their doctrines and their ethics are built round the life of a personal founder from whom they get their sanction, their authority and their power and strangely enough, upon the historicity of the founder's life is built, as it were, all the fabric of such religions. If there is one blow dealt to the historicity of that life, as has been the case in modern times with the lives of almost all the so-called founders of religion, we know that half of the details of such lives is not now seriously believed in, and that the other half is seriously doubted if this becomes the case, if that rock of historicity, as they pretend to call it, is shaken and shattered, the whole building tumbles down, broken absolutely, never to regain its lost status. Every one of the great religions in the world excepting our own is built upon such historical characters, but ours rests upon principles. There is no man or woman who can claim to have created the Vedas. They are the embodiment of eternal principles, sages discovered them, and now and then the names of these sages are mentioned, just their names, we do not even know who or what they were. In many cases we do not know who their fathers were, and almost in every case we do not know when and where they were born. But what cared they, these sages, for their names? They were the preachers of principles, and they themselves, so far as they went, tried to become illustrations of the principles they preached. At the same time, just as our God is an impersonal and yet a personal God, so is our religion a most intensely impersonal one, a religion based upon principles and yet with an infinite scope for the play of persons, for what religion gives you more incarnations, more prophets and seers, and still waits for infinitely more. The Bhagavata says that incarnations are infinite, leaving ample scope for as many as you like to come. Therefore, if any one or more of these persons in India's religious history, any one or more of these incarnations and any one or more of our prophets proved not to have been historical, it does not injure our religion at all, even then it remains firm as ever, because it is based upon principles and not upon persons. It is in vain we try to gather all the peoples of the world around a single personality. It is difficult to make them gather together even round eternal and universal principles. If it ever becomes possible to bring the largest portion of humanity to one way of thinking in regard to religion, mark you, it must be always through principles and not through persons. Yet as I have said, our religion has ample scope for the authority and influence of persons. There is that most wonderful theory of Ishta which gives you the fullest and the freest choice possible among these great religious personalities. You may take up any one of the prophets or teachers as your guide and the object of your special adoration, you are even allowed to think that he whom you have chosen is the greatest of the prophets, greatest of all the avatars, there is no harm in that but you must keep to a firm background of eternally true principles. 
The strange fact here is that the power of our incarnations has been holding good with us only so far as they are illustrations of the principles in the Vedas. The glory of Shri Krishna is that he has been the best preacher of our eternal religion of principles and the best commentator on the Vedanta that ever lived in India. The second claim of the Vedanta upon the attention of the world is that, of all the scriptures in the world, it is the one scripture the teaching of which is in entire harmony with the results that have been attained by the modern scientific investigations of external nature. To minds in the dim past of history, cognate to each other in form and kinship and sympathy, started being placed in different routes. The one was the ancient Hindu mind and the other the ancient Greek mind. The former started by analyzing the internal world. The latter started in search of that goal beyond by analyzing the external world. And even through the various vicissitudes of their history, it is easy to make out these two vibrations of thought as tending to produce similar echoes of the goal beyond. It seems clear that the conclusions of modern materialistic science can be acceptable, harmoniously with their religion, only to the Vedantins or Hindus as they are called. It seems clear that modern materialism can hold its own and at the same time approach spirituality by taking up the conclusions of the Vedanta. It seems to us, and to all who care to know, that the conclusions of modern science are the very conclusions the Vedanta reached ages ago, only, in modern science they are written in the language of matter. This then is another claim of the Vedanta upon modern Western minds, its rationality, the wonderful rationalism of the Vedanta. I have myself been told by some of the best Western scientific minds of the day, how wonderfully rational the conclusions of the Vedanta are. I know one of them personally who scarcely has time to eat his meal or go out of his laboratory, but who yet would stand by the hour to attend my lectures on the Vedanta, for, as he expresses it, they are so scientific, they so exactly harmonize with the aspirations of the age and with the conclusions to which modern science is coming at the present time. To such scientific conclusions drawn from comparative religion, I would specially like to draw your attention to the one bears upon the idea of the universality of religions and the other on the idea of the oneness of things. We observe in the histories of Babylon and among the Jews an interesting religious phenomenon happening. We find that each of these Babylonian and Jewish peoples was divided into so many tribes each tribe having a god of its own, and that these little tribal gods had often a generic name. The gods among the Babylonians were all called Baals, and among them Baal Merodach was the chief. In course of time one of these many tribes would conquer and assimilate the other racially allied tribes, and the natural result would be that the god of the conquering tribe would be placed at the head of all the gods of the other tribes. Thus the so-called boasted monotheism of the Semites was created. Among the Jews the gods went by the name of Moloches. Of these there was one Moloch who belonged to the tribe called Israel, and he was called the Molochave or Molochava. In time, this tribe of Israel slowly conquered some of the other tribes of the same race, destroyed their Moloches, and declared its own Moloch to be the supreme Moloch of all the Moloches. And I am sure, most of you know the amount of bloodshed, of tyranny, and of brutal savagery that this religious conquest entailed. Later on, the Babylonians tried to destroy this supremacy of Moloch Yahweh, but could not succeed in doing so. It seems to me, that such an attempt at tribal self-assertion in religious matters might have taken place on the frontiers and India also. Here, too, all the various tribes of the Aryans might have come into conflict with one another for declaring the supremacy of their several tribal gods, but India's history was to be otherwise, was to be different from that of the Jews. India alone was to be, of all lands, the land of toleration and of spirituality 
and therefore the fight between tribes and their gods did not long take place here. For one of the greatest sages that was ever born found out here in India even at that distant time, which history cannot reach, and into whose gloom even tradition itself dares not peep, in that distant time the sage arose and declared, He who exists is one, the sages call him variously. This is one of the most memorable sentences that was ever uttered, one of the grandest truths that was ever discovered. And for us Hindus this truth has been the very backbone of our national existence. For throughout the vistas of the centuries of our national life, this one idea comes down, gaining in volume and in fullness till it has permeated the whole of our national existence, till it has mingled in our blood and has become one with us. We live that grand truth in every vein, and our country has become the glorious land of religious toleration. It is here and here alone that they build temples and churches for the religions which have come with the object of condemning our own religion. This is one very great principle that the world is waiting to learn from us. A. You little know how much of intolerance is yet abroad. It struck me more than once that I should have to leave my bones on foreign shores owing to the prevalence of religious intolerance. Killing a man is nothing for religion's sake, tomorrow they may do it in the very heart of the boasted civilization of the West, if today they are not really doing so. Outcasting in its most horrible forms would often come down upon the head of a man in the West if he dared to say a word against his country's accepted religion. They talk glibly and smoothly here in criticism of our caste laws. If you go, to the West and live there as I have done, you will know that even some of the biggest professors you hear of are errant cowards and dare not say, for fear of public opinion, a hundredth part of what they hold to be really true in religious matter. Therefore the world is waiting for this grand idea of universal toleration. It will be a great acquisition to civilization. Nay, no civilization can long exist unless this idea enters into it. No civilization can grow unless fanatics, bloodshed and brutality stop. No civilization can begin to lift up its head until we look charitably upon one another and the first step towards that much-needed charity is to look charitably and kindly upon the religious convictions of others. Nay more, to understand that not only should we be charitable, but positively helpful to each other, however different our religious ideas and convictions may be. And that is exactly what we do in India as I have just related to you. It is here in India that Hindus have built and are still building churches for Christians and mosques for Mohammedans. That is the thing to do, in spite of their hatred, in spite of their brutality, in spite of their cruelty, in spite of their tyranny, and in spite of the vile language they are given to uttering, we will and must go on building churches for the Christians and mosques for the Mohammedans until we conquer through love, until we have demonstrated to the world that love alone is the fittest thing to survive and not hatred, that it is gentleness that has the strength to live on and to fructify and not mere brutality and physical force. The other great idea that the world wants from us today, the thinking part of Europe, nay, the whole world more, perhaps, the lower classes than the higher, more the masses than the cultured, more the ignorant than the educated, more the weak than the strong, is that eternal grand idea of the spiritual oneness of the whole universe. I need not tell you today, Men from Madras University, how the modern researches of the West have demonstrated through physical means the oneness and the solidarity of the whole universe, how, physically speaking, you and I, the sun, moon and stars are but little waves or waveless in the midst of an infinite ocean of matter, how Indian psychology demonstrated ages ago that, similarly, 
both body and mind are but mere names or little waveless in the ocean of matter, the samashti and how going. One step further, it is also shown in the Vedanta that behind that idea of the unity of the whole show, the real soul is one. There is but one soul throughout the universe, all is but one existence. This great idea of the real and basic solidarity of the whole universe has frightened many, even in this country. It even now finds sometimes more opponents than adherents. I tell you, nevertheless, that it is the one great life-giving idea which the world wants from us today and which the mute masses of India want for their uplifting, for none can regenerate this land of ours without the practical application and effective operation of this ideal of the oneness of things. The rational West is earnestly bent upon seeking out the rationality, the reso di etre of all its philosophy and its ethics, and you all know well that ethics cannot be derived from the mere sanction of any personage, however great and divine he may have been. Such an explanation of the authority of ethics appeals no more to the highest of the world's thinkers, they want something more than human sanction for ethical and moral codes to be binding, they want some eternal principle of truth as the sanction of ethics. And where is that eternal sanction to be found except in the only infinite reality that exists in you and in me and in all, in the self, in the soul? The infinite oneness of the soul is the eternal sanction of all morality, that you and I are not only brothers, every literature voicing man's struggle towards freedom has preached that for you, but that you and I are really one. This is the dictate of Indian philosophy. This oneness is the rationale of all ethics and all spirituality. Europe wants it today just as much as our downtrodden masses do, and this great principle is even now unconsciously forming the basis of all the latest political and social aspirations that are coming up in England, in Germany, in France, and in America. And mark it, my friends, that in and through all the literature voicing man's struggle towards freedom, towards universal freedom, again and again you find the Indian Vedantic ideals coming out prominently. In some cases the writers do not know the source of their inspiration, in some cases they try to appear very original, and a few there are bold and grateful enough to mention the source and acknowledge their indebtedness to it. When I was in America, I heard once the complaint made that I was preaching too much of Advat and too little of dualism. A. I know what grandeur, what oceans of love, what infinite, ecstatic blessings and joy there are in the dualistic love theories of worship and religion. I know it all. But this is not the time with us to weep even in joy, we have had weeping enough. No more is this the time for us to become soft. This softness has been with us till we have become like masses of cotton and are dead. What our country now wants are muscles of iron and nerves of steel, gigantic wills which nothing can resist, which can penetrate into the mysteries and the secrets of the universe and will accomplish their purpose in any fashion even if it meant going down to the bottom of the ocean and meeting death face to face. That is what we want, and that can only be created, established, and strengthened by understanding and realizing the ideal of the Advat, that ideal of the oneness of all. Faith, faith, faith in ourselves, faith, faith in God, this is the secret of greatness. If you have faith in all the 330 millions of your mythological gods, and in all the gods which foreigners have now and again introduced into your midst, and still have no faith in yourselves, there is no salvation for you. Have faith in yourselves, and stand up on that faith, and be strong, that is what we need. Why is it that we 330 millions of people have been ruled for the last 1000 years by any and every handful of foreigners who chose to walk over our prostrate bodies? 
because they had faith in themselves and we had not. What did I learn in the West and what did I see behind those frothy sayings of the Christian sects repeating that man was a fallen and hopelessly fallen sinner? There I saw that inside the national hearts of both Europe and America reside the tremendous power of the main's faith in themselves. An English boy will tell you, I am an Englishman and I can do anything. The American boy will tell you the same thing and so will any European boy. Can our boys say the same thing here? No, nor even the boys' fathers. We have lost faith in ourselves. Therefore, to preach the Advat aspect of the Vedanta is necessary to rouse up the hearts of men to show them the glory of their souls. It is, therefore, that I preach this Advat, and I do so not as a sectarian, but upon universal and widely acceptable grounds. It is easy to find out the way of reconciliation that will not hurt the dualist or the qualified monist. There is not one system in India which does not hold the doctrine that God is within, that divinity resides within all things. Every one of our Vedantic systems admits that all purity and perfection and strength are in the soul already. According to some, this perfection sometimes becomes, as it were, contracted and at other times it becomes expanded again. Yet it is there. According to the Advait, it neither contracts nor expands, but becomes hidden and uncovered now and again. Pretty much the same thing in effect. The one may be a more logical statement than the other, but as to the result, the practical conclusions, both are about the same, and this is the one central idea which the world stands in need of, and nowhere is the want more felt than in this, our own motherland. A. My friends, I must tell you a few harsh truths. I read in the newspaper how, when one of our fellows is murdered or ill-treated by an Englishman, howls go up all over the country, I read and I weep, and the next moment comes to my mind the question, who is responsible for it all? As a Vedantist I cannot but put that question to myself. The Hindu is a man of introspection, he wants to see things in and through himself, through the subjective vision. I, therefore, ask myself, who is responsible? And the answer comes every time, not the English. No, they are not responsible, it is we who are responsible for all our misery and all our degradation, and we alone are responsible. Our aristocratic ancestors went on treading the common masses of our country underfoot, till they became helpless, till under this torment the poor, poor people nearly forgot that they were human beings. They have been compelled to be merely hewers of wood and drawers of water for centuries, so much so, that they are made to believe that they are born as slaves, born as hewers of wood and drawers of water. With all our boasted education of modern times, if anybody says a kind word for them, I often find our men shrink at once from the duty of lifting them up, these poor downtrodden people. Not only so, but I also find that all sorts of most demoniacal and brutal arguments, culled from the crude ideas of hereditary transmission and other such gibberish from the Western world, are brought forward in order to brutalize and tyrannize over the poor all the more. At the Parliament of Religions in America, there came among others a young man, a born Negro, a real African Negro, and he made a beautiful speech. I became interested in the young man and now and then talked to him, but could learn nothing about him. But one day in England, I met some Americans, and this is what they told me. This boy was the son of a Negro chief who lived in the heart of Africa and that one day another chief became angry with the father of this boy and murdered him and murdered the mother also, and they were cooked and eaten. He ordered the child to be killed also and cooked and eaten. But the boy fled, and after passing through great hardships and having travelled a distance of several hundreds of miles, 
he reached the seashore and there he was taken into an american vessel and brought over to america and this boy made that speech after that what was i to think of your doctrine of heredity a eh? brahmans if the brahman has more aptitude for learning on the ground of heredity than the pariya spend no more money on the brahman's education but spend all on the pariya give to the weak for there all the gift is needed if the brahman is born clever he can educate himself without help if the others are not born clever let them have all the teaching and the teachers they want this is justice and reason as i understand it our poor people these downtrodden masses of india therefore require to hear and to know what they really are a let every man and woman and child without respect of caste or birth weakness or strength hear and learn that behind the strong and the weak behind the high and the low behind every one there is that infinite soul assuring the infinite possibility and the infinite capacity of all to become great and good let us proclaim to every soul arise awake and stop not till the goal is reached arise awake awake from this hypnotism of weakness none is really weak the soul is infinite omnipotent and omniscient stand up assert yourself proclaim the god within you do not deny him too much of inactivity too much of weakness too much of hypnotism has been and is upon our race o ye modern hindus be hypnotize yourselves the way to do that is found in your own sacred books teach yourselves teach every one his real nature call upon the sleeping soul and see how it awakes power will come glory will come goodness will come purity will come and everything that is excellent will come when this sleeping soul is roused to self conscious activity a if there is anything in the gita that i like it is these two verses coming out strong as the very gist the very essence of krishna's teaching he who sees the supreme lord dwelling alike in all beings the imperishable in things that perish he sees indeed for seeing the lord as the same everywhere present he does not destroy the self by the self and thus he goes to the highest goal thus there is a great opening for the vedanta to do beneficent work both here and elsewhere this wonderful idea of the sameness and omnipresence of the supreme soul has to be preached for the amelioration and elevation of the human race here as elsewhere wherever there is evil and wherever there is ignorance and want of knowledge i have found out by experience that all evil comes as our scriptures say relying upon differences and that all good comes from faith in equality in the underlying sameness and oneness of things this is the great vedantic ideal to have the ideal is one thing and to apply it practically to the details of daily life is quite another thing it is very good to point out an ideal but where is the practical way to reach it here naturally comes the difficult and the vexed question of caste and of social reformation which has been uppermost for centuries in the minds of our people i must frankly tell you that i am neither a caste breaker nor a mere social reformer I have nothing to do directly with your castes or with your social reformation. Live in any caste you like, but that is no reason why you should hate another man or another caste. It is love and love alone that I preach, and I base my teaching on the great Vedantic truth of the sameness and omnipresence of the soul of the universe. For nearly the past one hundred years. our country has been flooded with social reformers and various social reform proposals personally i have no fault to find with these reformers most of them are good well meaning men and their aims to are very laudable on certain points but it is quite a patent fact that this 100 years of social reform has produced no permanent and valuable result appreciable throughout the country 
Platform speeches have been made by the thousand, denunciations in volumes after volumes have been hurled upon the devoted head of the Hindu race and its civilization, and yet no good practical result has been achieved, and where is the reason for that? The reason is not hard to find. It is in the denunciation itself. As I told you before, in the first place, we must try to keep our historically acquired character as a people. I grant that we have to take a great many things from other nations, that we have to learn many lessons from outside, but I am sorry to say that most of our modern reform movements have been inconsiderate imitations of Western means and methods of work, and that surely will not do for India, therefore, it is that all our recent reform movements have had no result. In the second place, denunciation is not at all the way to do good. That there are evils in our society even a child can see, and in what society are there no evils? And let me take this opportunity, my countrymen, of telling you that in comparing the different races and nations of the world I have been among, I have come to the conclusion that our people are on the whole the most moral and the most godly, and our institutions are, in their plan and purpose, best suited to make mankind happy. I do not, therefore, want any reformation. My ideal is growth, expansion, development on national lines. As I look back upon the history of my country, I do not find in the whole world another country which has done quite so much for the improvement of the human mind. Therefore I have no words of condemnation for my nation. I tell them, you have done well, only try to do better. Great things have been done in the past in this land, and there is both time and room for greater things to be done yet. I am sure you know that we cannot stand still. If we stand still, we die. We have either to go forward or to go backward. We have either to progress or to degenerate. Our ancestors did great things in the past, but we have to grow into a fuller life and march beyond even their great achievements. How can we now go back and degenerate ourselves? That cannot be, that must not be going back will lead to national decay and death. Therefore let us go forward and do yet greater things, that is what I have to tell you. I am no preacher of any momentary social reform. I am not trying to remedy evils, I only ask you to go forward and to complete the practical realization of the scheme of human progress that has been laid out in the most perfect order by our ancestors. I only ask you to work to realize more and more the Vedantic ideal of the solidarity of man and his inborn divine nature. Had I the time, I would gladly show you how everything we have now to do was laid out years ago by our ancient lawgivers, and how they actually anticipated all the different changes that have taken place and are still to take place in our national institutions. They also were breakers of caste but they were not like our modern men. They did not mean by the breaking of caste that all the people in a city should sit down together to a dinner of beefsteak and champagne, nor that all fools and lunatics in the country should marry when, where, and whom they chose and reduce the country to a lunatic asylum, nor did they believe that the prosperity of a nation is to be gorged by the number of husbands its widows get. I have yet to see such a prosperous nation. The ideal man of our ancestors was the Brahman. In all our books stands out prominently this ideal of the Brahman. In Europe there is my lord the cardinal, who is struggling hard and spending thousands of pounds to prove the nobility of his ancestors, and he will not be satisfied until he has traced his ancestry to some dreadful tyrant who lived on a hill, and watched the people passing by, and whenever he had the opportunity, sprang out on them and robbed them. That was the business of these nobility-bestowing ancestors, and my Lord Cardinal is not satisfied until he can trace his ancestry to one of these. In India, on the other hand, 
The greatest princes seek to trace their descent to some ancient sage who dressed in a bit of lawn cloth, lived in a forest, eating roots and studying the Vedas. It is there that the Indian prince goes to trace his ancestry. You are of the high caste when you can trace your ancestry to a rishi and not otherwise. Our ideal of high birth, therefore, is different from that of others. Our ideal is the Brahman of spiritual culture and renunciation. By the Brahman ideal what do I mean? I mean the ideal Brahmanness in which worldliness is altogether absent and true wisdom is abundantly present. That is the ideal of the Hindu race. Have you not heard how it is declared that he, the Brahman, is not amenable to law, that he has no law, that he is not governed by kings, and that his body cannot be hurt. That is perfectly true. Do not understand it in the light thrown upon it by interested and ignorant fools, but understand it in the light of the true and original Vedantic conception. If the Brahman is he who has killed all selfishness and who lives and works to acquire and propagate wisdom and the power of love, if a country is altogether inhabited by such Brahmans, by men and women who are spiritual and moral and good, is it strange to think of that country as being above and beyond all law? What police, what military are necessary to govern them? Why should anyone govern them at all? Why should they live under a government? They are good and noble, and they are the men of God, these are our ideal Brahmans, and we read that in the Satya Yuga there was only one caste and that was the Brahman. We read in the Mahabharata that the whole world was in the beginning peopled with Brahmans and that as they began to degenerate, they became divided into different castes and that when the cycle turns round, they will all go back to that Brahminical origin. This cycle is turning round now and I draw your attention to this fact. Therefore, our solution of the caste question is not degrading those who are already high up, is not running amok through food and drink, is not jumping out of our own limits in order to have more enjoyment, but it comes by every one of us fulfilling the dictates of our Vedantic religion, by our attaining spirituality and by our becoming the ideal Brahman. There is a law laid on each one of you in this land by your ancestors, whether you are Aryans or non-Aryans, Rishis or Brahmans, or the very lowest outcasts. The command is the same to you all, that you must make progress without stopping, and that from the highest man to the lowest Parya, everyone in this country has to try and become the ideal Brahman. This Vedantic idea is applicable not only here, but over the whole world. Such is our ideal of caste as meant for raising all humanity slowly and gently towards the realization of that great ideal of the spiritual man who is non-resisting, calm, steady, worshipful, pure and meditative. In that ideal there is God. How are these things to be brought about? I must again draw your attention to the fact that cursing, and vilifying and abusing do not and cannot produce anything good. They have been tried for years and years, and no valuable result has been obtained. Good results can be produced only through love, through sympathy. It is a great subject and it requires several lectures to elucidate all the plans that I have in view and all the ideas that are in this connection coming to my mind day after day I must, therefore, conclude, only reminding you of this fact that this ship of our nation, O Hindus, has been usefully plying here for ages. Today, perhaps, it has sprung a leak, today, perhaps, it has become a little worn out. And if such is the case, it behaves you and me to try our best to stop the leak and holes. Let us tell our countrymen of the danger, let them awake and help us. I will cry at the top of my voice from one part of this country to the other to awaken the people to the situation and their duty. Suppose they do not hear me, still I shall not have one word of abuse for them, 
not one word of cursing. Great has been our nation's work in the past, and if we cannot do greater things in the future, let us have this consolation that we can sink and die together in peace. Be patriots, love the race which has done such great things for us in the past. A. The more I compare notes, the more I love you, my fellow countrymen, you are good and pure and gentle. You have been always tyrannized over, and such is the irony of this material world of Maya. Never mind that, the spirit will triumph in the long run. In the meanwhile let us work, and let us not abuse our country, let us not curse and abuse the weather-beaten and work-worn institutions of our thrice-holy motherland. Have no word of condemnation even for the most superstitious and the most irrational of its institutions, for they also must have served some good in the past. Remember always that there is not in the world any other country whose institutions are really better in their aims and objects than the institutions of this land. I have seen castes in almost every country in the world, but nowhere is their plan and purpose so glorious as here. If caste is thus unavoidable, I would rather have a caste of purity and culture and self-sacrifice than a caste of dollars. Therefore utter no words of condemnation. Close your lips and let your hearts open. Work out the salvation of this land and of the whole world, each of you thinking that the entire burden is on your shoulders. Carry the light and the life of the Vedanta to every door and rouse up the divinity that is hidden within every soul. Then, whatever may be the measure of your success, you will have this satisfaction that you have lived, worked, and died for a great cause. In the success of this cause, howsoever brought about, is centered the salvation of humanity here and hereafter.